All right. Uh, okay. So welcome uh, back to class. You know, I just also want to take a moment to acknowledge um, kind of the, I don't know if you've been following the news today, but there's quite a bit of chaos and uh, stuff happening. And um, and I don't, I don't have very many comforting words to say other than, um, you know, I understand that, you know, the, the events in the news can be disturbing and, um, and stressful. And, uh, and if you need to kind of take a moment to kind of just step back and reflect on all of that, um, you know, I, I encourage you to do so. If, uh, if you're able to block it out, then, then, then that's also fine. Um, uh, everybody has different ways of dealing with stress. Um, and, you know, if, uh, you know, if it's affecting your ability to focus and concentrate, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to be listen. Uh, I'll try to listen and uh, be accommodating in that way. Um, I don't want to just ignore it and pretend like nothing crazy is happening in the world, but, uh, or at least in our nation, but <clears throat> just, uh, just want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, so uh, today we'll, uh, we'll start looking at some programming and coding concepts uh, in earnest. And so first up, I just wanted to give you some tips at least on setting up your working environment in our studio, okay? So, and, and just so you know, um, and I think you guys are familiar with this, but you have R, which is kind of the base language and, uh, and programming system. And then R Studio is kind of a de integrated development environment, which is a program that sits on top of R and, and makes use of the R language and there's a lot of features built into our studio that make our life nice, okay? And so, um, so we often do all of our work in our studio. Um, so anyway, the, the first thing that, that I wanna talk about is uh, setting your working directory. And, uh, and this is gonna be important because as far as, um, you know, as far as this, this week's homework goes, you know, you have to uh, read in a file uh, with month names and things like that. And, uh, and to make sure uh, you can read it in, you got to make sure you set your working directory. And so I often put the, uh, the file that I'm working on and along with any other files that I need to, uh, to reference into the same directory. And I will set in my session, I set the working directory. Sorry for a second here. Sorry for a second. Okay. All right. And so, uh, so you can set your uh, working directory uh, this way. Okay. Um, you can also set and check your, you can check your working directory using um, get working directory. And you can also set your working directory from the command line using set working directory. Um, and then you just kind of give it the path. Um, path names in windows use backslashes. And so that doesn't work. Um, so you can actually use a forward slash and, uh, and R will figure out that you mean kind of the, uh, the traditional backslash, or you can do double backslash and, uh, and R will figure this out. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, when you knit uh, a document in R and R markdown, uh, one thing it does is it starts with a completely empty uh, environment. And, um, and basically, Anything, uh, if you reference any kind of object, you know, whether it's a function or, you know, some vector X or whatever it is, if that's not defined inside the code within the R markdown document, it's going to run into an error. Okay. And so one common problem that students run into is that uh, they are working on the code uh, in R in their console and they define variables and things in their environment. And so the code works when they are running it uh, kind of while they're working on the document, but then when it comes to knit the document, uh, the knitting process doesn't work. And the problem there is that the code to define the objects are written kind of in their console and have been defined in the environment, but they don't, the, the code to define the objects do not exist inside the R markdown document, okay? And so kind of one thing to kind of help make sure things are working properly is you can kind of 
hit the uh, broom here, and this is going to just kind of clear out your entire environment, and you can go chunk by chunk to um, to kind of verify and make sure it's going to work. Okay, so uh, so this is one way to kind of clear the environment. Another way you can do it uh, just from the command line is you can do rm. Rm is going to just remove objects, and you can say rm list equals ls, and this is just going to remove ls lists off everything that exists in the environment. And so if you do rm list equals ls, it's going to remove everything that exists in the environment. So that's going to wipe everything out. Uh, this is also another important thing that I highly recommend is that you do not, uh, that when you start up R, you always start it empty with nothing loaded into the environment and that you don't save any of the uh, stuff in your environment uh, when you exit, okay? And you feel like, well, I want to save my stuff. Um, if you want to save your stuff, you should explicitly save it, okay? And you shouldn't just count on R Studio to, to save all of these things, okay? And then the reason why I uh, highly recommend that you uncheck restore this is that sometimes um, when you restore a workspace, um, it's gonna load up some packages and things like that, and it can throw off the namespace and it can throw off some certain settings. And so um, code that works on someone else's computer might not work on yours because you're loading up some old data, okay? And so, uh, so I highly recommend that you uncheck these things and, um, and, and set this accordingly. Okay, uh, and, and this is just kind of text justification for what I just said here. Um, so you're, there are ways to save your data and things like that. I would just say don't, don't count on RStudio to do it for you. You can um, comment your code uh, quickly uh, using um, command or control shift C. So you can comment out entire chunks of code here. So, uh, so for example, right here, uh, if I wanted to just take entire lines of code, uh, rather than having to go through and enter um, pound in front of them or the hash mark in front of them, I can just hit command shift C and it's gonna comment on or off all of those, uh, all of those lines of text, okay? Yes, uh, I have a dark mode, uh, uh, just a dark theme. So under global options, uh, under appearance, you can change your, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's editor theme. It's the editor theme. Where is it? Um, somewhere. It's that scroll down list that you have. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The editor theme. Yeah, you can change. You can change the um, the uh, the the settings there. Okay. Um, and then writing scripts, uh, create a new file, control shift and uh, to run lines of code, you can hit control enter. Okay. So one thing that always kind of kills me is some, when I see somebody taking their thing and then they, they, um, or I'm sorry, they, I don't know what they do. They, <laughs> they highlight the thing and they hit control enter or something. You don't need to do that. You can just kind of hit one line, control enter, control enter, control enter, control enter, and it goes line by line. It, it just, sometimes during office hours, I'll see students like highlight this and then copy and then paste it down here. And I'm just like, just please just hit control enter, 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 enter or something. Or you can just hit the little play button in the corner and it's gonna run uh, all of those lines of code. Uh, inside your console, you can clear out your console just by hitting control L. You can also click the little broom thing. And that's a, that's a quick little thing. So these, these are just nice little features. And again, delete the environment by hitting the, uh, the bloom over here. Okay. Um, and you can source an entire script. If you have a script, you can just hit control shift C or control shift X there. Okay. Uh, other things, control L, command L to clear the console. To knit your current file, you hit uh, command or control shift K. Restart your R session. Uh, a lot of times you can fix issues by restarting your R session. Okay, <laughs> those are just some things. All right, let's let's get into um, basic data structures. I've got a lot of slides to get through. I don't know if I'm going to get through all of them. I think these slides, at least for today's, are pretty self-explanatory and things like that. Um, I cover a lot of details and a lot of edge cases. Um, students always ask, do we need to memorize all of these things and, and all of that stuff? Um, and the answer is like kind of, 
um, you know, maybe you don't know all of the, uh, the answers of like what's gonna happen in a certain edge case, but you should be aware that these edge cases do exist. And um, because a lot of times, you know, if everything, if nothing was an edge case, then when you write your code, you never run into errors and stuff, okay? But the chances are is that you're gonna write code, you're gonna run into an error, and probably the error is being triggered by some kind of edge case, all right? And so it's, it's important to be aware of the edge cases so that you can debug your code, okay? So, you know, people complain, and I haven't figured out how I'm going to do my midterm, but in the past, on the midterm, I put on a bunch of edge cases and people would complain, you know, Professor Chen asked all of these trivial things. I mean, there's some truth there, but it's the trivial things that cause a ton of the errors, like 80% of your errors are trivial edge cases that you just didn't think about, right? Okay. Um, what's the difference between an atomic vector and a list? Anybody? Okay. An atomic vector can only have like one type, whereas a list can contain multiple. Atomic types. vector is homogenous in that it can only have one type, okay? So the most fundamental object that we create in R is the atomic vector. Okay, which is just a, gonna be a collection of values in some kind of order. We've got six types. There's logical, double, integer, co character, complex, and raw. And we probably deal only with the first four um, in earnest, okay? Um, I use type of, I know stats 20, you guys use mode. And the only real difference is that mode shows up real, as numeric for these things and type of differentiates between double and integer, okay? Double is a floating point number. Uh, double precision floating point number means it uses 64 bits or eight bytes to store the value. And, uh, and we'll talk about exactly what floating point means. Um, whereas integers store exact values. Doubles are always just kind of um, numeric approximations uh, for, for any kind of decimal value here. Okay. Um, R will just automatically convert between integers and double values, so we don't really have to worry about it. Um, but the key difference is double numeric values are stored with floating point, integers are stored as exact integers. Um, the default numeric type is double. So when you type in the number three, it's going to be a type double three. Okay. Uh, if you want an integer, you have to do like three L, or but if you use the colon, it also generates integers. Okay. So if I create a vector one, two, three, and I say, what is the type of, this is double, okay? One colon three, and I say, what's the type of, this is integer, okay? So there's a, there's a dis difference between this and this. Even though these look the same, they're not identical. Um, if I say, is this double, is one double, that's true. Uh, one L on the other hand is integer. So if you wanna create a integer one, that's gonna be one. All right. Um, lists, on the other hand, allow for uh, mixing of data types, okay? So if, if everything is the same type, that's a, a homogeneous list, okay, uh, or an atomic vector. And if you have different types of stuff, this would be a list, or we can consider that a generic vector, okay? If, if you put this in um, kind of a two-dimensional structure, a matrix is homogeneous. Everything in a matrix has to be of the same data type. If you want to have different data types that show up, you're going to have a data frame. And then if you want something more than two-dimensional, uh, you can create an array and uh, we don't have something that exists as a heterogeneous um, uh, analog for the n-dimensional array. All right, we've got Attributes. Attributes are just kind of, um, it's, a, it's arbitrary information, okay? Arbitrary metadata that gets, uh, sometimes gets attached to an object, right? So you have an object and you have uh, some arbitrary information that you want to attach to it. And you can basically attach it via a list. And that list is called the attributes of this thing. Um, Two attributes are very important, and that's the dimension. The dimension attribute will turn a vector into matrices and arrays. And then the class attribute um, powers the object system, the S3 um, 
kind of object class system, which, uh, which we'll talk about later, all right? Um, so we'll answer all of these things. This is like, if you want to quiz yourself as you're going through the, uh, the notes and stuff, um, we'll, we'll answer these. Let me give you your first quiz answer for, uh, for today's lecture. And your first quiz answer today is A, A as an apple. A as an apple is your first quiz answer. So jot that down, A as an apple as your first uh, view quiz answer. Have you guys messed around with attributes? Kind of, maybe, sort of. Messed around with the dimension attribute at least, maybe. Okay. All right, so, um, so for example, trees is a data frame, okay? Trees, I think trees is a data frame, yeah. Trees is a data frame and we can ask, uh, what are the attributes, okay? Uh, ATTR uses, uh, gets a single attribute and attributes will give us the entire list of attributes, okay? So I can give us, ask what are the attributes of trees? And it says, this is a data frame under class attributes. It says, this is a data frame. And under names, this has the three columns. The names of the three columns, girth, height, and volume. I guess this is information for uh, the tree, okay? And then uh, how many rows there are, there are row names, okay? And the row names are just, is just this uh, vector of, of numbers, okay? And, um, and so when you ask actually how many rows are in attribute, uh, how many rows are in trees, what it does is it looks at row names and it sees how many values are in row names and it, and it says, well, there's 31 values. So that's how many rows we have in this thing, okay? Now, this list of attributes is just, it's just an arbitrary list. And so you can throw in just arbitrary information here. We got, um, here we have this data frame is about trees. And I'm just gonna throw that into the, uh, I'm gonna set that using ATTR, okay? I'm setting it by doing ATTR on trees, and here I'm just creating a new thing. And later on, when I say, okay, give me the list of attributes for trees, it just tacks this on, okay? And so this, you can put whatever you want. You wanna put another data frame here, you can, okay? It's just, you're just throwing stuff into, uh, you wanna put a function into the attributes, you can. Um, it, it's just kind of like having a sheet of paper and you're stapling it on, okay? So you've got this, uh, you know, it's like you're shipping an, an object and then you're, you're just taping on some, some information like the shipping manifest or something. And, uh, and kind of the default things are here, but if you wanna put on extra information, you can. All right. Um, a matrix in R is, is an atomic vector uh, with a dimension attribute of length two. So here I'm creating just a vector of integers, one through 10. This is an atomic vector of integers. And I can say, okay, well, what is the class of this? Okay, and we haven't really talked about class, but class will give us information about, um, if, if it's not an S3 object, it's gonna tell us basically it's data type. It says this is just a bunch of integers here. And then I can set the attribute, right? So this is how we can set attributes. I say ATTR on this vector M we're gonna just establish the dimension attribute. This wasn't around before, but now there's now M has a dimension attribute and the dimensions will be this vector two by five. So we're gonna say, uh, I, wanna, I want the, it to have two rows and five columns. And so now it has turned M into a two by five matrix, okay? And, uh, and notice the way it populates it, it it fills it out column wise. So it goes one, two, three, four down the column, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It does not go one, two, three, four, five across the row, but it goes down the column. Okay. And that's kind of the how R populates a, uh, a matrix here. Okay. Is that okay? As far as turning this uh, length 10 vector into a two by five matrix? Um, professor? Yeah. Um, going back to the data frame, how come that doesn't have a dimensions attribute? Yeah, so the data frame just doesn't have a dimensions attribute. Uh, as far as the 
when the per when R decided to define classes and things like that, and they said, hey, we want to create a two-dimensional structure. They said, um, when we create a data frame, all we need is names and row names. So you can ask, what are the dimensions of trees? And it will say it's going to be 31 by 3. It's going to say that. But what it's doing is it's getting the 31 by looking at the length of row names, and it's going to say 3 by looking at the length of names. But it but there's not a dimension attribute for a data frame. And that's just how they do decided to define the data frame object. So that's just when R said, the people who designed R said, we want to create a data frame that allows for columns of different data types. That's how just how they do, decided to do it rather than using this. OK? Uh, and over here, for matrices, there is a dimension attribute. Okay, You can ask for the dimensions of a data frame, and you can ask for the dimensions of a matrix, um, but you're going to get answers different. Um, they're going to get your answer in different ways. Um, you can ask, what are the attributes of M? Now that I've set the dimensions of, of M to be this, I can say, what are the attributes? And it's a list with only one attribute listed, dim, and that's a 2 by 5. Now, when I ask class on M, the class function will look at this and go, oh, it looks like um, I see dimension attributes. So that's got to mean it's a matrix, OK? Uh, and, a mate, and it actually says it's a matrix and array. So uh, a matrix is just a special case of an array in that a matrix is a two-dimensional array, OK? Whereas array is a little bit more generic. So this says, you know, it's a matrix. It also counts as an array. It's a special case of an array, OK? Um, if we want to get rid of the dimension attribute, I can just kind of uh, null it out. Okay, so I can say set the uh, dimension attribute to null. Okay, and so that's not that's different, right? Um, I'm not saying the dimensions are zero zero, because if I set zero zero, then the dimension attribute still exists. Here, I want to actually like destroy it, and so I, I put in the null object, and this actually. This kills it. It's it's different from assigning like the value zero, okay? Because I could have a vector of zero zero here, and then it would still have a dimension attribute. But here we're gonna null it out, okay? And that turns m back into a vector. And I say, what's the class? And it's an integer here. M remains the same. M m m has always just been this atomic vector. And the only thing is, you've got this atomic vector one through ten. And at one point in time, we um, we attached attributes, and then and then uh, and then we decided to take the attributes away. And when you have the dimension attribute, it it's a vector. I mean, it becomes a it becomes a matrix. Uh, here is a, an array, and this just allows for a kind of a three dimensional structure, okay, or a higher dimensional structure. So here I've got the integers one through twelve, and it's going to be uh, two rows, three columns two layers or two levels, OK? So uh, two rows, three columns, one, two, three, four, five, six on the first layer or first level, and then 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 on the second level, all right? And that's what we have here, OK? And uh, and you can also create a, an array just using array and say array 1, comma tw uh, one through 12 and put in the, um, the uh, dimensions there and the definition of the array. All right, is this is this okay so far? Okay, I'm, I know I'm kind of moving through this quickly. Um, you know, as you go back and study and review these notes, you know, just any kind, anytime you have come across, you know, a function here, type it into R and put in a question mark. Uh, just play around with it and see uh, see what you can create. Okay, Dr. Miles. Yes. I have a question. How come there's commas before the ones and twos? Right here. That mean? Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so this is this is how we refer to the uh, first row in a so you have a you basically have a three dimensional structure and so to identify something that exists in three dimensional space you need three coordinates right you need to have uh, basically an x a y and a z except here it's the row the column and the level or layer okay and so to kind of indicate this is the first layer all right we're basically leaving uh, give me all rows all columns first layer only. And that's what we have here. Uh, the blank is all rows, all columns, second layer only. 
Okay, that's that's kind of what we have. And I, I, I hope that clears it up. Okay, uh, data frame um, is actually a list. If you ask type of on trees, it's going to be a list. Whereas you know class is the object class, and so this is a data frame. But internally, a data frame is stored as a list, and this is actually a list of three vectors. Uh, each vector is length thirty one. I've got a vector called girth, and it's length 31, vector height, length 31, vector volume, length 31. And it's uh, and we've got these three vectors stored inside a list. And then the data frame says, oh, you've got these three vectors stored in a list. When I present it, we're going to present it in this table fashion. And that's what we have here. OK. Um, we'll look at. Um, you know some of these things in, in more detail uh, on Friday when we when it comes to uh, subsetting. Uh, we have factors, okay? Uh, and I'm assuming you guys dealt with factors already, either in Stats 20 and maybe already right now in Stats 101A. You're maybe I don't know. Probably at some point in 101A, you'll you'll come across factors. Okay, so factors are a way for us to represent categorical values, right? So you've got categories. And internally, a factor is an integer vector. It's an integer vector. And there's just attributes that tell us um, what these integers represent. OK, so here I've got this is just a character vector, MFFXMF, OK, for, for uh, gender. And we can turn this gender vector, OK, this vector of letters, characters, into a factor. Okay. And what R is going to do is it's going to say, OK, here are the unique values. And when I print this out, it comes out like this. right? And so one thing we know, we can tell immediately that this is not a character vector because there's no quote marks. right? This is a character vector. It's got quotes around F, quotes around M, quotes around X. So we can tell this is a character vector. This, not a character vector, but it's got letters and stuff. And it also prints out levels. So this is, this is how R prints out factors right and um, and so we can say all right um, what is this it's stored internally as an integer integer vector okay and if I say okay well turn it back into integers okay we can do as dot integer and that's gonna turn the factor into integers and it says okay you've got an M that's a two you've got an F that's one F1. The X is represented with a three, the M is represented with a two, and the F is represented with a one here. Okay. And if you ask what are the le uh, attributes of the factor, there's two, two things here. Okay. We've got the levels, and this is how it goes from the integers into uh, what gets represented in the factor. And it says, oh, you know what? Uh, two, the second value corresponds to M, the first value corresponds to F, the third value corresponds to X. Okay. Um, and the, the class is factor, and this, this just informs R how it should kind of interact with this stuff, right? And so, so this is um, how a factor gets coded. So it, it, it's stored as integers, and, uh, and it keeps kind of what the levels represent uh, as an attribute. So one thing that can happen is if you try to turn a numeric vector into a factor, it might have some unexpected behaviors, right? So I've got 0, 1, 10, 5. And I, if I say, hey, I'm going to turn x into a factor, OK? So this is the x factor. And, and now it's got, um, this is now treated as a factor. Now, if you try to say, well, what is uh, what is the mean of this this factor here? It it doesn't work. Okay, when you take uh, the mean, it doesn't know how to take the mean of a categorical variable. When you say this is a factor, you're basically telling R this is a categorical variable. Okay, and so um, so it's not able to give you something like the mean, right? Because because the mean only exists when you have numeric values, right? So you can say like, um, we have three people on our team. This person's age twenty. This person's twenty five, and this person's twenty two. What's the mean age? That works fine, okay? 
On the other hand, if you have something like uh, someone's zip code or area code, right? What, what's your phone number? Oh, my area code is 213, my area code is 212, and my area code is 818 or something like that. Does it make sense to take the mean area code? It does not, right? Because there's no, there's no numeric value being represented by this thing. And so, so even though there are numbers, I mean, technically you can throw them into the computer and add them up and divide by three and stuff like that. There's no inherent meaning to the mean area code of a thing because it, it, you, can't, you can't say um, Los Angeles people have one more area code than New York or something like that, right? 213 versus 212 or something. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Um, OK, so this is, this is what we have here. And, um, and so what you can do is you can say, well, I want to turn the factors back into numbers. You can say as numeric. And you say, well, what's the mean? OK. And then if you think about it, 0, 1, 10, 5, those add up to 15, 15, I mean 16 divided by 4. The mean should be 4, but I'm getting a mean of 2.5. OK, why am I getting a mean of 2.5? Well, as numeric factor, says th these are the values, right? It's the integers are one, two, four, and three, and the levels are zero, one, five, ten. Okay, so so the the number zero, one, ten, five are represented with integers of one, two, four, three. I don't. Does it kind of do you understand like what's happening here? Why we're getting just two point five and not the mean of this? So what you have to do, okay, is you have to do something like you take this factor. Then you have to turn them into characters. And then so it'll say, OK, character 0, character 1, character 10, character 5. And then you say, OK, and then treat those as numbers. And then it'll go, OK, that, and then we've got 0, 1, 10, and 5. And then you can calculate the mean. And then you'll get 4. OK, so this is kind of a roundabout way. Um, I would say you shouldn't do this. This is, this is silly. Um, but sometimes it happens. Like when you import a file, you have a column of numbers, OK? But somewhere in that column of numbers, somebody puts in a dash, OK? And then R sees that dash, and it goes, oh, no, these aren't numbers. These are characters. And so it turns the whole thing into a factor, OK? And then you're trying to clean up this mess. And you might be tempted, and you just go like, OK, here's the dash. Let's delete the dash, and let's turn everything into numeric. But when you do that, you're going to run into this issue. So you have to turn everything into characters, then into numerics, and then, and then take the mean. This is like a, this oddly specific case, but it, it's happened enough that I feel like I got to warn you about it and, and maybe, maybe you'll run into it. Okay. Um, other rules about factors. You can't try to like, you can't meaningfully combine factors using the combine function here. Okay. So you've got um, here, I got factor AB. And if I do factor BC and if I try to combine them, it's going to turn this into a integer vector one two one two, in or one two, and this is an integer vector one two. And so when you combine them, it just gives you one two one two, which is just doesn't work that way. Okay. If um, if you have a factor and you try to put in a value that doesn't exist, this is just uh, the way um, the factors are designed. It's going to say you know this isn't allowed. Okay. The levels that are allowed are f, m, and x. And if you try to put in the word male here, it's going to it's going to give you an NA, all right? It's, it gives you a warning. It says, you know what? I'm not sure if that's what you did. Wanted, OK? I did my best <laughs> according to the rules. And according to the rules, I got to put in an NA. All right, so far, so good. All right, let's give, give you a, your second view quiz answer. Second view quiz answer is B, B as in bear. B, okay. And if you um, like, if I give you a view quiz answer and like your audio cuts out, you can you can ask in the chat what the uh, what the view quiz answer is. Don't don't feel like um, you can't ask questions about that. Okay, but the second answer is B. All right. Um, R does coercion. Um, and so R is what we call a dynamically typed language. And, uh, and that makes R easy, but then it also means um, there's rules you have to remember as far as how the dynamic typing works, right? So, so 
I don't think you ever took C++, but when you do C++, you have to say like, this is an integer and this is a, you know, this is a floating point thing and, and this is character and, or string and stuff like that. And if you try to do math with an integer, it's going to result back in integers and stuff like that. Whereas R, it's like, oh, you got some integers here, and then you do some division. I'm automatically going to make some um, uh, type, you know, some some floating point numbers here. Um, and then, you know, conveniently, you can also take logical values like true and false, and you can um, R will just kind of coerce them into zeros and ones for us. Okay. And so here I've got L for logical values, I for integer, D for type double, and CH for type character. And, um, and when you combine them together using C, these, the resulting atomic vector is only allowed to contain one data type. All right? And so what R is going to do is it's going to coerce everything into a single type. Okay? And so when you do this, what it does is it looks at what data is coming in and it's going to course everything to the least restrictive type. Okay. And so these are kind of in order of restrictiveness. So characters, the least restrictive logical is the most restrictive. So if you combine logical integer and double, it's going to course everything to the least restrictive type, which is type double. If you course uh, logical double and character, it's going to course everything into the least restrictive type, which is character. Okay. And so, so this will end up type double. This will end up type character. Okay, so when you combine the logical, the integer, and the double, what you get is the logicals get coerced into. So everything gets coerced into type double, and so the logicals, the true and the false, will get coerced into one zero. The integer one is one, and then the double is five six seven. Okay, over here I've got logical integer and character. Oh, this is. I accidentally typed the different things here. Okay, but anyway, uh, the result is that they, everything gets coerced into character. And so here the logical, which is true or false, gets coerced into characters of true or false. The integer, which was one L, gets coerced into the character value one. And then here I've got AB um, being the character values and that those remain, remain characters. Okay. Um, Coercion happens implicitly. You don't even have to say, I want you to kind of combine these things or I want you to do as dot numeric or something like that. So this is an explicit coercion. You can say as numeric, turn these, turn this logical vector of false, false, true into numeric values. Okay, and it's gonna give you zero, zero, one. Okay, but you can also just say um, sum, sum trials, right? So take, take this logical vector and apply sum and this is automatically going to say, hey, you know what? When I ask you to add numbers together, I'm expecting numbers and you're giving me logical values. And so R is automatically going to convert these into um, zeros and ones. And it's going to add them up and go zero, zero, zero plus zero plus one is one. So the total number of trues is one. You can also ask for the mean here. And we go, okay, what's the mean of zero, zero, and one? And that mean is 0.33 which is really nice because now it just gives you the proportion that is true, okay? And so without having to do any kind of conversion and redefining anything, you can just kind of call mean on a logical vector, which means at some point you can have a data frame and you can do a logical test, right? You can say column, uh, column gender equals equals male, right? And this is gonna be everybody who you know identifies male or something in your, um, uh, in your data frame. And then you can just call mean on that logical comparison and it'll give you the proportion uh, of trues for that, for that thing here, okay? So you get uh, the proportion that are true and, that, and that's just a really convenient thing. Um, you can do it explicitly, okay? By calling, I wanna do it as dot characters, as logical. And so, um, so here just kind of puts quote marks around everything. Zeros and ones will get coerced to false and true. Um, if you try to do something that it doesn't know what to do with, right? Like turn cat into a number, it's gonna say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm gonna give you an NA, okay? And it gives you a warning, right? Probably you're gonna run into this in your homework, okay? So these are just some rules about how things get coerced, okay? So when you do as logical, 
zero will become false. Everything else becomes true, okay? So negative one becomes true, 0 0.1 becomes true, negative infinity, this huge number, all of, everything else becomes true, okay? Zero is the only thing that becomes false, okay? Um, you can take uh, character things, and these are accepted ways of spelling false and true, okay? So all of these things will get coerced into false. All of these things will get coerced into true. Um, anything else, like if you do a lowercase f, it doesn't know what to do. Lowercase t doesn't know what to do, okay? And um, why did this zero and this one not get coerced into false and true here? It initially coerced implicitly to character and then tried to go from character yeah, to logical. Right? So, so if you do as logical directly on a numeric value of zero and one, it, it'll coerce it to false and true, no problem. But here, because I'm combining it, I'm combining it here with characters, it's gonna coerce these things into characters first. And so now I have the character zero and I have the character one and character zero and character one will not get coerced into um, falses and truths. Um, we've got NAs, nulls and NANs. Okay, so NA, these are, <laughs> R is special. Okay, R is special because it has NA. And this is why um, R was designed specifically with statistics in mind. And when you deal with statistics, missing data is just part of life, okay? Um, and, and we needed, uh, the designers of R said, we need a way to represent missing values, okay? And that's separate from null, which is nothing, and nan, which is not a number, okay? In Python, there's no NA, everything gets, reported with, with NAN, okay? Um, so NA is used for missing or unknown values. Uh, you have an NA for each data type. That's the logical and the character and the double and things like that. Uh, null is rep used to represent empty or non-existing values. And the null is its own data type. And NAN, NAN is not a number, and it is, but it is a type double, okay? It's type double. There's no NAN, that, there's no integer NAN, there's no logical NAN. NAN is a type double thing, okay? And it's like, what happens if you try to do some like illegal math? And so there's technically, the regular NA is a type logical NA. You also have NA that goes into integer vectors, NA that go into uh, double, it says real here. And then you have NAs that go into character vectors here, okay? And, and the reason why we, we need four different types of NA is because each atomic vector can only have one type of value, right? So atomic vector can only have one type. So if you have character values and you wanna include an NA, you need an NA that's of type character. If you have integer values and you need an NA, you need an NA that's of integer type. So we have an, NA for each of the different data types. Uh, professor, uh, yeah. why is there no NA for a logical? This, this is the NA for logical, okay? And uh, the reason why it's not defined is this, is that when you just type in NA, it starts off as logical. And if you combine the logical NA with any other type of vector, it's gonna get coerced, right? And logical is the most restrictive type. So it's gonna get coerced into one of the least less restrictive types. So. So if you have a character vector and you put an NA, which is the logical NA, and then you close off that combine, it's gonna get coerced to the character NA, okay? If you try to check for NA, is NA equal to NA? You cannot use this, right? Is, is something NA, it, it's gonna come back as NA. So you can, you can think of NA as like mystery box and mystery box, right? Is this mystery box, is the value inside this mystery box equal to the value in this mystery box? And the answer is, I don't know, okay? And that's what NA comes back as, right? But you can say, is this an unknown value? And that's true, right? Is, the, what, is this a mystery box? Do you know? Do you not know what it is? Yeah, that statement is true. So you check it with is NA, okay? Is NA. Null is its own data type. If you say type of null, if I did type of NA, it would come back um, logical. Um, and if I did type of any of these things, it'll come back what you'd expect. Okay, type of null, null is its own type, okay? You can check if something is null, is it the null object by using is null, okay? And again, null is not mystery box, null is nothing. <laughs> and so if you ask something like, is, 
is the null value a missing object, it comes back as a length zero logical vector, right? Because in a, is NA, any type of is question is going to return a true false. But here, it's asking, you know, give me a true false, but for this thing that doesn't exist. And so you have no answer. It's not a, it's not an unknown. It's, it's, it's a length zero. So that's what logical zero is. It's a length zero. It's a logical, we're expecting something of a logical data type, but it's length zero. Okay. Um, is it a logical vector? No, that's false. Okay. And if you try to do math with the null, it returns back basically when you do false plus with a plus. Why is this coming back integer? Well, the plus coerces the false into an integer type. Okay. And then now we're doing a null plus a zero. And then you say, well, you can't, you can't. You got a length zero thing and you're adding something. So it gives us back a length zero integer vector. If you try to include null into some kind of vector that exists, so I've got, I'm combining four, five, null, and three, it basically as if like that thing isn't even there. Okay, it just gives you back four, five, three. Um, is null equal to null? Okay, this gives you back a length zero thing. You got it. You got to check using is it null? Is dot null? Okay. All right. I'm like running out of time here. Okay. Um, I think you're familiar with some of the vectorized stuff, right? So I've got x is 1, 2, 3, y is 100, 200, 300. You can add them, and it kind of adds them element-wise. 1 plus 1, 100, 2 plus 200, 3 times 300. Multiplication goes similar and stuff like that. OK, let me give you your last quiz answer, and then I'll just let you read these last few slides on your own. I think that's fine. OK, last quiz answer for today is E, e as an elephant. E as an elephant is your last quiz answer. OK, so third quiz answer, view quiz answer is E as an elephant. We'll end there for today. Um, I'll let you guys just read um, read these last few slides. I think it's fine. And um, and yeah, we'll see you guys on Friday. I'll, uh, I'll put up a little um, worksheet for you guys to sign up for, um, I guess, dinner with eight stats strangers. And maybe you'll get to know some of your classmates despite the um, <laughs> distance learning here. Okay. Um, all right. We'll see you guys on Friday. Have a good night.